I've titled my talk, Progress at the Speed of Trust. I am Jutta Tovaranus, and I'm the director of the Inclusive Design Research Center at OCAD University in Toronto, Canada. Artificial intelligence can be seen as a power tool, like moving from a hammer and chisel to a powerful motor. It can do the things that we have done before, but more efficiently, accurately, and consistently. It can hyperdrive us in the direction we're already headed in. This begs the question, is this the direction we want to speed in? Are we actually speeding in the right direction? Here I'm showing a recent global risk assessment chart ordered by Severity, published by the World Economic Forum. It includes issues such as climate action failure, extreme weather, biodiversity loss, social cohesion erosion, livelihood crisis, infectious diseases, human environmental damage, natural crises, and many others. And I'm sure that we can add our own personal risks. Do we want to do what we have always done more accurately, consistently, and efficiently? Where are we collectively headed? Do we want to put this course on hyperdrive? AI amplifies, accelerates, and automates the harms of past patterns. And since we're talking about disability, disabled people will and already do feel the extremes of both the harms and potential benefits. They are the vulnerable edge of every other group that is this in this global experiment. Let me explain. Over my 40 years in the field, I've been collecting data about what diverse people need to survive and thrive. The only way I can plot this is using a 3D multivariate scatter plot. The needs of any given population looks like a starburst. I've dubbed this the human starburst. Like a normal distribution, 80% is clustered in the middle, 20% of the space, and the remaining 20% is distributed in the periphery, in the remaining 80% of the space. Data points in the middle are close together, meaning they are more alike. Data points at the periphery are further apart, meaning they are more different from each other. Because of economies of scale and conventions like the 80-20 rule that say to ignore the difficult 20% and take 80 that take 80% of the effort, almost anything that is designed works for the middle, is difficult to use as you deviate from the middle and doesn't work for you if you are at the jagged edge. And the design of the AI ecosystem is no different. Any statistic, statistically determined prediction is highly accurate in the middle, inaccurate as you move from the middle and wrong as you get to the edge. Here I'm not talking about AI's ability to recognize and translate things that are average or typical, like typical speech to text or from one typical language to another, or to label typical objects in the environment, or to find the path that most people are taking from one place to another. But even there, if your speech is not average or the environment you in are is not typical, AI fails. This pattern ripples through every aspect of our lives, creating greater and greater disparity whether it is in our designs, the products that make it to market, the knowledge we recognize as evidence, our education which pushes towards standardized learners, or systems of employment which attempt to create replaceable workers, and our systems of governance which in defending democracy have reduced it to one person, one vote, meaning that the critical needs of the margins are outweighed by the trivial needs of the majority. It is detrimental to the edges, but also to the majority, in that it leads to mass production, mass communication, mass marketing, a popularity push, and it compromises innovation, creating greater conformance, lock-in, decreased flexibility, decreased extensibility, and decreased resilience and responsiveness. 
The conventional patterns we've adopted reduce diversity and deny complexity. And the only thing that is actually certain is death and disability. If we consider the diverse margins, we leave room for change and growth when the unexpected happens. And most of us know that innovation is at the edge, not the complacent middle, and people at the edge are the first to detect the weak signals of crises to come. When we use the term AI, we obscure the very different generations of AI. For the first generation, we said, here are the rules, follow them literally and accurately. For the second generation, we said, here is available data, use statistical reasoning to optimize the metrics we identify. This is usually profit, attention, or the successful status quo. For the third generation, we said, here's all the data we have, you figure it out, and make new connections based on past relationships. The first generation is doing formulaic things more accurately, consistently, and efficiently. The second generation is making decisions for us more accurately, consistently, and efficiently, amplifying, accelerating, and automating discrimination and speeding disparity, projecting our past onto our future, and it is deployed pervasively. This pattern is happening with all life-altering, difficult decision. AI is being applied and offered to competitive academic admissions departments, to beleaguered health providers in the form of medical calculators and emergency triage tools resulting in more iatrogenic death and illness if you're different from your classification, to policing, to poli parole boards, to immigration and refugee adjudicators, to tax auditors, meaning more taxpayers with disabilities are flagged, to loans and mortgage officers, meaning people with unusual asset patterns won't get credit, to security departments, meaning outliers become collateral damage. At a community level, we have evidence-based investment by governments, AI guiding political platforms, public health decisions, urban planning, emergency preparedness, and security programs. None will decide with the marginalized outlier and outliers will be marked as security risks. There are, these are monumental life-changing decisions, but even the smaller, seemingly inconsequential decisions can harm by a million cuts. What gets covered by the news? What products make it to market? The recommended route provided by the GPS the priority given to supply chain processes, what design features make it to market. Statistical reasoning as a main means of making decisions does harm. AI amplifies the harms of statistical reasoning. Statistical reasoning as the means of making decisions harms those not like the statistical average or the statistically determined optima. Assuming that we know about the majority applies to the minority does harm. The third generation of AI is hijacking our narrative and manipulating our perception of reality. In the process, it has been used to create a smokescreen of sorts, so we don't notice that we have relinquished our decision-making to the second generation. Think of all the hype that comes with chat GPT, generative AI and large language models. I said extreme benefits earlier. Here we need to have an understanding of disability and technology. There's a saying that for most people, technology makes things convenient. For people with disabilities, technology makes things possible. Therein lies an awesome responsibility. Technology is a re relied upon to speak, read, write, learn, affect the world, navigate the world, eat, express love, remember, plan, 
breathe, live. Our relationship to technology, if we have a disability, is by necessity more intimate. It is essential because we have no choice. It is what makes things possible. This relationship also makes us more vulnerable. We should not have to give up give our trust to an abusive partner. We are disproportionately vulnerable to the mistakes, to the breaking. Beyond guarding our homes, it is implanted in our brains and in our vital organs. This allows for extreme opportunities to recognize speech, gestures, patterns, find a target object or pattern, match and label objects, remember forever and remind on time, sort possible paths to find the optima, detect common mistakes and correct them. And it is mechanizing many formulaic things that help people with disabilities, recognizing objects if you are blind, translating gestures, acting as robotic personal service workers, creating intelligent prosthetics, restoring vision, reading your mind through your EEG patterns. No wonder disability is often the poster child of AI. It is a different story, however, when AI is used in finding, matching, sorting, labeling, measuring, optimizing, calculating, analyzing people at scale then you will find yourself excluded or flagged as an unrecognizable threat. Mass media has always been a power tool. It can be a weapon of mass destruction. You know that, and every dictator and autocratic government knows that. Media helps us reflect on who we are and who we can be. It is the arbiter of our perception of truth. What happens when we unleash AI on media? To today's question, what happens to disabled people when we unleash AI on media? What is the data we have fed AI about disability? It is a horrifying cocktail of ableist slurs Disabled people are seen as inferior, unattractive, tragic, victims, suffering. There are plenty of bad jokes involving disability. And then we have the benevolent ableism that draws attention and, and tugs at our heartstrings, or what has been called inspiration porn. What is missing is the authentic, complex, hugely diverse picture of disability. And that is almost completely missing. The complexity of a life with disability, the diversity of disability. But even if it was present and we were able by some miracle to fill the vast data desert, AI is still homogenizing all of the things that it is fed. And disability is about difference. Fair treatment of people with disabilities by AI requires more than addressing data gaps or removing human bias from algorithms or even removing stereotypes from the labels and proxies and data that AI has been fed. AI is built to be biased against difference. Disability is difference. Different ways of doing the job, different digital traces, different work and education history, different, different social media topics, an entangled profile of many differences. As AI gets better or more accurate in its identification of the optima, AI gets more discriminatory or there are more ways to be different. The tragedy of the current trajectory we are on is that media was moving toward a more pluralist, expansive, diversity supportive, and complexity aware narrative. There was a nascent emergence of more authentic pictures of living with a disability. If we turn media over to AI, we turn it over to homogenization. The formulaic or hallucination using the data we have fed AI and the values they reflect. 
the rare authentic portrayal will be drowned in the flood of garbage. Truth is complex and multi-perspectival. Let's not use st a statistical machine and recombination engine to reflect our truth. Yes, we are passing reg regulations to prevent harm and negative impact. Among them are the EU AI Act, which is very much in the news at the moment. But we are using the same discriminatory statistical reasoning in AI ethics. If you are an outlier, then you are invisible in a risk benefit framework. You are seen as an anomaly, merely an anecdote. People with disability will be seen as a trivial sacrifice for the greater good. Uses in media are afforded few protections. Most media impacts are deemed low risk or low impact. We have conflated subtlety, diffusion, and complexity with triviality. But we have ignored something that we call cumulative harm, or you can call it torture by a thousand cuts. If every daily decision is not in your favor, if every portrayal mirrors and reinforces existing stereotypes, and often in monstrous, previously unarticulated forms, there is egregious cumulative harm. And the situation in the media ecosystem is compounding. Hiring algorithms will filter you out if you have a disability. So the people designing, developing, producing, directing, publishing media will not include you. So it is less and less likely that you can play a part in creating authentic stories. The tools needed to participate are not accessible. Existing legislation has seen you as merely a consumer, not a producer of media. The AI ethics industry and the regulators have missed statistical discrimination. So things will be deemed ethical and compliant despite the harms you feel. And what does it feel to be marginalized as an outlier in the face of a statistical power tool? Our community members speak of being alone, powerless, unheard, invisible, and misrepresented. But even if you are not an outlier, at the moment, it feels to me that we have naive competitive toddlers at the wheel of a powerful weaponized machine that they neither understand nor know how to control. It also feels like we have set our next generation, our own young children, on a speeding machine careening down a perilous terrain. So what do we do? I think we need to fundamentally examine the direction we are powering toward. Here I will borrow from complexity theory. Imagine that our future is a complex mountainous terrain clouded in fog and the water level is rising. We need to find a global optima out of crisis for us all. But as a society, we are stuck on a global, on a local optima. We are optimizing the patterns of the past to get climb up this local tiny hill. In the process, we're eroding the slope and making it harder for people below to climb out of danger. The tragedy is that just out of sight, there's a large, generous mountain that could fit all of us and that we won't be submerged. However, to get to it, we need to reverse direction and go, and go against much of what we have been taught, all the formula we think will lead to our success. Rather than going up our stingy, steep mountain, we need to go down and find the more generous, higher plateau where we can collectively survive and thrive. <laughs> Illustrating this in a mon more mundane example, you're likely aware of word clouds. The conventional word cloud increases the size and centrality of the most popular or statistically frequent words. The less popular or outlying words decrease in size and disappear. This means that if you're an outlier, you become invisible. We've tried inverting that behavior. 
the novel and unique words go to the center and grow in size. We've also created a framework for our practice. We call it the three dimensions of inclusive design. The first dimension is recognizing that we're all different and we are the experts of our difference. The vast range of differences needs to be addressed in an integrated, not segregated way. The second dimension is that we need an inclusive process. We need to bring the largest diversity of perspectives to the process. It needs to be the individuals with the greatest challenges that help design the process and frame the challenges. We need to continuously ask who is missing? Who have we left behind with this innovation? The third dimension is recognizing that we live in a complex adaptive system. We need to seek benefit for all. Nothing is done in isolation. Everything is entangled and variable. Problems are not monocausal. The path out of our problems is not linear or formulaic. There is no fixed solution or success. It is a continuous process, but it is the people at the margins that are most familiar with the risks and opportunities. We apply these dimensions in what we call our virtuous tornado. Unlike the design thinking squiggle, which iterates to a winning solution, we co-create an adaptable system that stretches to encompass more and more of the missed needs by continuously asking, who are we missing? We appreciate the imperfect, impermanent, and incomplete, and know that mistakes and failures yield the greatest learning. We have applied this process to large language models for people who need them the most. We are developing trust meters that tell deployers of AI whether the AI will recognize and decide fairly regarding the people in front of them. In Canada, we have drafted an accessible and equitable AI standard for the Accessible Canada Act. It layers on top of other regulations to ensure that people with disabilities can participate in AI ecosystems and are treated equitably by AI. We're attempting to create the equivalent of those warning labels that come with all other power tools. And most importantly, I think we need to progress at the speed of trust. Trust by the people that will be most impacted and most harmed by the power tools we are deploying. And we know that intelligence that works with the edge of our human scatter plot is better able to adapt to change and respond to the unexpected, detect risk, transfer to new contexts, results in greater dynamic resilience and longevity, will reduce disparity, and may hold the key to our survival. <laughs>